save me from myself Each of those fantasies Draw from an empty well Written by the same mind That would have me say Who's out to get mine How can I hold my place Lay my money down Step out of time Am I ready to gamble with life Lay my weapons down Fall out of line Am I ready to gamble with life It's not a waste of time Hey, Mia. Hey. Thank, thank well, okay. you for coming on The Right Night. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And thank you for playing that wonderful version of Gambling. Oh, cheers. It sounds kind of autobiographical, those lyrics. Is, is that based on your experience, that song? Definitely, yeah. I mean, I, I never write anything that's sort of particularly story-based about my life, but there's just some elements of being someone who went, you know, up and uh, moved to another country mm. and the feeling of... Um, First of all, being very challenged and very, you know, sort of out to sea. Yeah. Um, and then starting to have this wonderful feeling of being a citizen of, like, the world as opposed to, a, you know, one place or one location. Right. And starting to feel the world get smaller in terms of um, music is a great connector and, yeah. and, and having that um, way to meet people and that way to connect to a place. Yeah. So um, there's that element in it and, and certainly the song is... is is autobiographical in the sense of, you know, my own, like, encouragement to myself about, like, um, you know, 
I mean, the line mainly, you know, it's not a waste of time to play without a victory. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I, I think applies, you know, we just, I think as humans, we're so hard on ourselves yeah. thinking unless we can, you know, live up to the sort of ultimate bar that other people set, um, we're not good enough or we're not doing yeah. enough. And I think I've done a lot, but I just don't, you know, like I'm trying to remember that. Yeah, you know? it's a standout line, that one. And immediately, the first time I heard it, I thought, ah, oh, that's such a great line. Thank you. And Thank you. I mean, you mentioned moving overseas, which I think you moved to LA in about 2010. Yes. What was it like hopping off the plane and going, here I am? Right. Well, first I moved to Boston right. um, just a few months before that uh, because... It seemed like the East Coast was the place to be touring. I was mm -hmm. thinking like I'm going to be touring a lot and East Coast is so dense with touring. Um, and so I landed in freezing Boston at mm -hmm. like April. Um, the snow had melted, but it was still freezing. Right. And uh, it was intense. Like I, I think if I'd known how hard it was going to be, yeah. I wouldn't maybe have gone. But I'm so glad that I did. Yeah. And I think that's the thing about life. Like glad we don't know what's actually coming because yeah, yeah. Um, we might get you know, put off and I just, it was, I didn't know anyone. It was um, uh, very challenging, but I had a booking agent and I was playing mm -hmm. music and, but I couldn't afford to pay a band. It was like, right. I'd, I hadn't kind of gotten around the idea that like, I won't have the same career just starting from nothing in America as I have in Australia. So, yeah. and yet I was living as if I would, I right. was thinking as if I would. And of course that was, came to a screeching halt. It was like, oh right. yeah, I don't have... I don't already have a bunch of fans and, yeah. you know, so um, it was it was challenging. But then I moved to LA, which is way more, um, like way less culture shock, I guess, okay. I think, because it's warmer. Yep. It's a little more, um, the desert kind of is reminiscent of Australia, yep. not necessarily, you know, I mean, more the centre of Australia, but I've spent a lot of time in the desert in Australia too. Yep. So I felt more at home there. Okay. Yeah. Right, and gambling's taken from your new album. Yes. Six. Um, if I only said so far, I take it back. Yes. Let's start with that title. Where did that title come from? It comes from the the song "Open," mm -hmm. which the whole song is kind of a a call to what's the word? Not call to arms in the sense of <laughs> weapons, but like <laughs> for myself about like being courageous. Like yeah. if I said this is this is as far as I can go, mm -hmm. I take it back. Like I want to I want right. to push that. Um, that limit that I might have self-imposed or I might feel is, is imposed on me. Okay. Um, and so every line in that song is like, if I, if I, you know, maybe once I said this, but yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, go a little further, yeah. push a little harder. And is that indicative of, of some of the themes on the album? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of sort of looking inward. And, oh, and absolutely. It's a very, it's a very self-reflective album. I mean, this, this past many years, um, you know, I just, I've, I, I, I think a product of getting older, but also, um, you know, meditation and mm. self-reflection work um, has really brought me to like, yeah, like I'm, I'm singing much more about those kinds of themes of, of how I am the architect of, either my own suffering or my own happiness. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I, I always have a choice in the moment about how I react to things, even though like, it doesn't always feel like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always feel like a choice when we get overwhelmed by emotion. Or, yeah. but, um, but learning to like, you know, feel those feelings and, and, um, and not necessarily um, push them away mm -hmm. or go through them rather than around them. And yeah. Yeah, been doing a lot of that stuff. Okay, that's pretty powerful <laughs> stuff. It is. It's huge. I mean, it's, it's been life-changing. I, 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 I can very easily say I'm a much more fulfilled and happy person than I was in my 20s. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I mean, I just, it, it seems crazy because there's something about being in your 20s where it's like, this is when we're supposed to be having fun. Like, this is, everyone thinks that youth is the best time of life. And yeah. I think it's wrought. I think yep. it's um, if you're lu if one is lucky, I think things get better yeah. as as we age. Absolutely. Yeah. And the record was recorded at Portside Sound in Alabama, which used to house the Muscle Shoals Sound Studio. Yes. Which is a place where I think the Stones did Brown Sugar and mm -hmm. Rod Stewart did Atlantic Crossing yes. and Paul Simon's recorded there, amongst many others. What's You've done your research. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't have to remember right. all of this. But what's it like to walk into a building that has that kind of heritage? Can you feel it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I first went to Muscle Shoals in advance of making the record mm -hmm. and 
did a little tour of the studios, Fame, which is the original one where like Aretha Franklin and yeah. Wilson Pickett and Etta James recorded. And um, uh, I was drawn there because I met John Paul White of mm-hmm. the Civil Wars, who's a Muscle Shoals native. Yeah. Um, and we talked about maybe making a record together. And uh, it was, it's magic down there. Like I'm not a particularly woo-woo person, but <laughs> the feeling down there with the songwriters, and to this day, like there's this community of amazing songwriters, yeah. producers, musicians, and studios yeah. still operating, um, that gives this place a feel that, I mean, maybe I'm just tapped into it because I've mythologized Muscle Shoals since I was a kid. Right. Um, but I don't know, I was very excited to be there. And we got to play um, with David Hood on bass. That's right. Who's from the Swampers. I don't know if you've seen that Muscle Shoals documentary. I haven't seen that documentary. You have to see that documentary. Right, okay. It's amazing. It's yeah. a really great, I don't love music documentaries always because they're not always well made. But yep. this one is very unique and special. Yeah. And um, David built the studio that we, I mean, David and the Swampers, mm-hmm. who all played on those original sort of 60s R&B soul records. Yeah. Um, they built that studio that we played in oh, wow. for them, you know, as musicians when they wanted to break out on their own. Yeah. Um, so we got to record. And it was on the Tennessee River, which is this huge, you know, American-sized river. Right. Um, <laughs> like you walk out the front door and it's you know, a huge river. Yeah, it's right. Beautiful. And David, I mean, some of the songs that he played on, I think he played on I'll Be There by the Staple Singers. Yep. Um, and Mustang Sally, the original, Amazing. like Wilson Pickett. Yeah. Did he have yeah. some stories to tell? Did you get to ask him about any he, of that? He was... So humble and so sort of quiet and soft-spoken. He definitely, I'm just trying to rack my brain. I know we kind of picked his brains. We were always like, with the kids going like, yeah. tell us a story, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was just a sweetheart. And I look, you know what? I cannot remember, but I've got, my memory's gotten worse. That is something that's that has thing. gotten worse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but did you hear, I mean, when you listen to the album now, can you hear that environment and the influence of those players. Absolutely. Can, you can hear that in the Yeah, in the especially his bass playing. Like, I mean, you know, the, I didn't go in there to try and make a Muscle Shoals, like, mm. sound record, mm. uh, you know, a, a throwback record or anything. But his bass playing has this simplicity and depth and, like, deep sort mm-hmm. of fatness to it that I think brings a groundedness and a, and a um, I don't know, it's just something super solid to yeah. the record where where we were sort of experimenting, I was certainly experimenting a lot with guitars and guitar sounds and mm-hmm. there's all these amazing guitars and amps and stuff in the studio to play with. Um, but his presence and his bass playing kind of anchored Great. the record. And, and certainly I felt influenced by the place, yeah. even though it wasn't like a stylistic thing of trying mm-hmm. to sound a particular way. But um, it was a really fun experience to yeah. be down there. So the record is coming out on Single Lock it in the US. It is. And Cooking Violin in Australia. Yes, my first time on a label. Right. Which is kind of a big deal. Six albums in. Six albums in, yep. So has that always, you've always just really preferred the independent path? Or? Well, when, I've, when I was, you know, 20, I thought, I'm going to get signed to him. You know, like I thought, of course, I'm going to yep. get signed to a major label. And none of that happened. Right. And, but by my second record, I was like, you know, it was, it was really the burgeoning of that um, DIY time Mm -hmm. um, where MGM distribution was like putting out, like John Butler was self-releasing records and suddenly it was like, oh, we can do it ourselves. Um, So I was um, in a just, I just happened to land in a a, a great time where um, it made sense to put my own records out and and worked really well. Um, And then, you know, the record industry has kind of gone a little bit. Um, And I'm just at a point too of like, I'd love to just try something different and yeah. especially with people that I really respect. Mm-hmm. It's not like signing to a major and having mm-hmm. sort of control taken away from me. We made the record, then they were interested to put it out. So we just hand them the finished yeah. record. We don't have to, um, you know, listen to listen their, to their opinions yeah. about what song's good or whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled. And, and then Cooking Vinyl is their partner in, in yeah. Australia and they put out some of my favourite artists too, listen to Williams. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm really, it's so nice to have the, the workload handed off yes. to label. I bet. So before we let you go, we're yes. going to hear one more song, Being Scared. Yes. Which opens the record. I know. And crazy. it's quite a, it's, it's a beautiful song, but it's quite, uh, I guess, unusual for you to open a record with such a gentle yes. song. It is unusual for me. Yeah. I, um, and in fact, this song all along, um, I wrote it, uh, it was one of the earlier songs you know, that I wrote for this record. And um, 
I found it very sort of vulnerable. I think, you know, especially in my 20s, mm -hmm. like my, my, in my music arsenal was like, I've got to sing big and loud. And, and I think also being like a young woman in the industry, I've got to like prove myself. Mm. And so that was my MO. And so singing in this sort of gentle, vulnerable way is a little, um, yeah, it's like I'm not so used to it. And I wrote this song that was, there's no other way to sing it. You can't mm -hmm. try and sing it big. I can't try and sing it big. So, uh, but my my bandmate, Aaron Sydney, said, uh, was like, that's that's an amazing song. Like that, and then Ben Tanner was like, that song, it's really, and I'm like, oh, I don't know about that song. Like it's, <laughs> it's, 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 is it good? I don't know. Right. But we recorded it and then we, you know, it just kept evolving into a song that I felt really great about, even though I still feel kind of vulnerable singing it. And then it was like, well, it, it made the most sense to put it first. It was yeah. a very strange evolution. Um, and I've never put a song like that first on a record. So who knows? Yeah, well, it's a great start to a record. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for, for visiting us on You're The Right so Note. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. I thought